And another great day in this greatest nation on God's green earth. A great day to focus for just a few moments on how to succeed. How to succeed in politics, how to succeed in pop culture, how to succeed in romance, how to succeed in your career, how to succeed in arranging an economy, a criminal justice system, and more. All of those questions are addressed in a fascinating new book. It is called The Upside of Down, Why Failing Well is the Key to Success. And I know that there's a kind of a reaction to this book, and that was my reaction when I first heard about it, too, before I actually read the thing, which is, oh, yeah, okay, we've heard it before. Uh, the, 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 the next step after you fail is bringing yourself up off the bottom and then succeeding. Megan McCardle who is a well-known and well-respected contributor to Fox News and MSNBC and NPR, uh, who has written for The Atlantic, The Economist, and is a regular columnist at Bloomberg View. Megan McCardle has had lots and lots of interesting things to say about various economic uh, issues, largely from a libertarian perspective. And she is the author of this new book, uh, The Upside of Down. It's posted up at our website at michaelmedved.com. First of all, Megan, congratulations. Thank you very much. Well, congratulations not just on the book, but on getting your life together after <laughs> some pretty difficult innings, which you describe in the book. Yes. I, uh, at the beginning of the book, I, I explained the reason I wanted to write this was that I'm sort of the Paganini of failure. Um, I've basically, you know, I've been through long-term unemployment. I've been through bad breakups. I've been through a lot of the things that derail people. Um, and at the end of all of it, uh, the reason I wanted to write this book is that I actually did realize not just that it was a growth experience, but that looking around at people who had been through similar things, that it matters a lot how you handle these things and that there are a few common errors that we all make that if you can conquer them are actually like, really are the ways that you can turn a failure into sort of pre-success. 1-800-955-1776 is our phone number. The Upside of Down is posted at our website. Uh, Megan, one of the things that interested me in this is uh, I'm thinking, as I think a lot of other people are, about um, what's going to happen to the conservative movement. Uh, are, are we doomed, as uh, Dan Baltz over at The Washington Post says, to uh, an eternity of Democratic presidents, that the Democrats are going to keep winning and winning and winning, and there's no hope for the conservative side. So a lot of people are saying, okay, so how do we select uh, a candidate? How do we select someone who we know is going to do well? And there's a passage in your book, and it's right in the middle of the book, that I thought was evocative on that. And uh, you say that... Um, um, to return to our opening story, there is ultimately no way to know whether something works until you put it out there and see how you target aud your target audience reacts. You're talking about the new Coke. Oh, that was supposed to be such a popular thing and it failed. A good experiment can tell you a lot, but people who run tests for retailers say that even the most successful test doesn't tell you this strategy works. What actually shows is something consistently more modest, like this strategy seems to be successful on Saturday mornings in Midwestern supermarkets located in busy shopping centers. So what all of that says to me, looking at politics for just a moment, we'll get to personal relationships and economics in a, in a second, is that uh, really part of what you're saying is that until you've actually tested a candidate on the market, say in a presidential primary, there's no real way of predicting whether somebody is going to be marketed successfully. Would you apply that lesson to things like presidential politics? Absolutely. You know, there's a little bit of a way to tell. As the, the guy who gave me that quote said, and he's done a lot of these tests um, on, on everything from retail to corporate strategy and compensation, um, he said, you know, you can't sell someone a cow patty on a plate. There are some products that you know aren't going to do well. You know, liver-flavored yogurt is probably just not going to be a big seller. But short of that, once you've gotten to that fairly low threshold of this person can walk and talk, speak English, communicate clearly, um, doesn't just say revolting things to everyone he meets, then you really do have to put that person out there and see how they do. There is no substitute. And if you look at a lot of political candidates in history, people, Ronald Reagan, right? 
an actor? How could he be president? Doomed, obviously. Um, and yet he, he was one of the most successful presidents of the 20th century. So there really isn't a substitute for putting someone out there and seeing how things go and also sometimes running the experiment again to go back to Reagan. Um, you know, he wasn't successful in his first few forays into national politics. And then his moment came, partly because he had learned from a lot of the mistakes he made early and partly because the national moment had changed and the nation was ready for a completely new direction. And he was there to seize that moment. There, there's a, a little bit of a contradiction, though, and I, I, I see this in the in the center of, of your argument. And let, let me focus it, if I can, just in terms of what goes on with politics. And you mentioned President Reagan. It's true that he, he lost and when he, he didn't really run seriously as a candidate in 1968 when Nixon got the nomination. That was just a brief afterthought. He had just been elected governor. But he was uh, his first run for public office. He's elected governor of California in 1966. Boom. Very successful. Triumphant reelection in 1970. He runs for president, comes close to unseating an incumbent president, Gerald Ford, and then runs in 1980. Landslide, 84 landslide. In other words, he was as a political product, pretty consistently popular. Um Barack Obama had this one failed congressional campaign, but when he ran for state Senate and then when he ran for U.S. Senate, even though it's a short career, it's pretty popular. On the one hand, you're saying that you you judge things based upon marketing them. And on the other hand, you say there's no substitute for failure as terms in terms of a a schooling for an individual. Abraham Lincoln had lots and lots of failure, political failures, business failures, all kinds of failures. Do you think that it's important for a candidate that we choose to not only show a record of political success, but an experience of personal failure and overcoming it? Yes, actually. And I think that Ronald Reagan is in many ways, a great example of that. You know, he came up in the studio system of old Hollywood. And when that petered out, and he realized that, you know, this was not his moment. He found an entirely new career at which he was phenomenally successful at. He had had experiences of overcoming obstacles, of learning to do something different. And he had had a lot of experience in governors. And while he was a very successful governor, I think he would have been the first to admit not everything he tried did well. And that may, you know, I think that, that Barack Obama actually probably could have benefited from longer in office, from more experience with the everyday business of getting something done in politics when you don't have all of the cards running your way. Instead, he was kind of anointed out of what was a really a very brief political career in which he didn't even have time to really try and fail because he was just getting his feet wet when he was lifted up to the next level of office. Yeah, I mean, one of the things about President Obama that's sort of striking, Megan, and I, I couldn't help thinking about it, we were talking um, earlier in this show about his his high school record. He's never really had uh, personal failures. He's had personal obstacles. I mean, a father who abandoned him when he was a little kid and a mother who wasn't really very interested in her children. But in terms of going to an elite prep school, doing okay, getting scholarships to uh, Occidental and then Columbia and then Harvard Law School being uh, a reasonably well-paid community organizer for a while after college, all of that – you can't point to President Obama and say, oh, this broke his heart. This was something he really wanted, and he failed at it. But for most of the people who have gone on to be president of the United States, you do have something like that, right? Yes, and I think that that's actually a, a big gap. I think it's something that um, I talk about this at the beginning of the book, is that it's a larger gap in the way that America is now rearing its elites, is that it's supposed to be this unbroken experience of going from good school to good school to well-padded job, um, not taking a lot of risk, kind of going from one place to another, and as you say, not really, really wanting something and doing your best to get it and then having your heart broken. And that's and, actually and you, a really you, good experience for people because not just because it teaches you how to overcome, and I think that a lot of Obama's reactions to, say, the problems with Obamacare show just how unaccustomed he was to that, but also because it puts you in touch with your constituents, many of whom are out there breaking their hearts, trying something, you know, working for a big dream that's also a big risk every day. The book is called The Upside of Down. 
when we come back, we'll talk a little bit about some of the implications of this for personal life. Uh, you talk about the tendency to bubble wrap kids to try to protect them from any kind of failure or disappointment or heartbreak. And, and you also uh, talk a good deal about your own experience and heartbreak, but you don't really say how you overcame it. We'll get to that and more with Megan McArdle, the book, The Upside of Down. 1-800-955-1776. The Michael Medved Show. 1776 That's 1-800-955-1776. MichaelMedved.com. And on the Michael Medved Show, we're talking about the new book, The Upside of Down, Why Failing Well is the Key to Success. And the book is fascinating because it's all over the lot. It's a little bit about politics, a lot about economics, a little bit about personal life, a lot about the criminal justice system. And one of the things that Megan McArdle does is she goes through conspiracy theories. And uh, why they usually don't add up. And I do want to get to that and and much more with Megan McArdle. But, Megan, I, I, I mentioned at the very beginning, you have a big emphasis on, on the book in storytelling. And you're a fine storyteller. And you tell a lot of stories about yourself and um, about a particular relationship that you had where you were hoping it was going to lead to marriage and it didn't. What you don't really do in the book, and I was kind of expecting it, is talk about how that failure and that bad investment that you made of your time led to what you describe as now exactly the life you want with the husband that you want. Uh, Is there a story there that is going to be coming out in another book? Yes, well, there's a story that will be coming out uh, around publication time. Um, one of the interesting things for me was that I went I went through a relationship that dragged on for nearly four years of sort of will we, won't we, and then eventually um, he indicated that he wanted to get married, and then four days later indicated that he wanted me to move out, um, which I did. And uh, I picked up, and eventually I picked up and, and moved to Washington. I just said I need to not be in the city for a little while, so... The first lesson I learned was that sometimes you really just have to cut your losses. You have to to pick up and move on. But the second lesson I learned was that I had been really afraid for a long time to force the issue. I had not wanted to say, if we're not going to get married, I'm going to get out of this relationship because I was in my early 30s and I thought it would be hard to date. Um, That turned out not to be the case at all, uh, funnily enough. So uh, ladies who are in this situation or gentlemen, um, it's a lot easier to date than you think it will be. You tend to catastrophize. But when I, I met my, the man who is now my husband, I sat down um, with him pretty early in our relationship, about nine months in, and I said, look, I am not going to want to just stay together and not get married. I'm not saying we, we have to get engaged right now, but you should just know that at some point I'm going to say either we get married or I'll leave. And I thought of myself as just communicating to him that really what I was, you know, where, where I was in the relationship, but really what I was saying was, um, was doing something I'd been really afraid to do before because I'd been afraid the consequences would be so terrible that he would walk out. And what I realized in retrospect was that I had gotten exactly the consequences that I was afraid of, except that before they happened, I had wasted three years on a relationship that wasn't going anywhere. And so this time I said, this is what I want. I'm not afraid to say it. Um, I'm not going to do the same dumb thing again. And about three months after that, he proposed. Um, he says I gave him an ultimatum. I, I didn't see it that way, but I thought I was just being honest and open in our communication. Um, but it really changed how I approached this. Is instead of being afraid of the worst thing that could happen, I realized that ending it wasn't the worst thing that could happen. The worst thing that w- could happen was that I would waste a great deal of time hoping that it wouldn't end and then have it end anyway. And so by following well, that, I actually ended up getting what I wanted. Don't they say in sales that you can't be afraid to close? At some point, you have to say, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Prospect, uh, can we take your order? Exactly. Uh, let's take uh, our caller, Will, in Hackensack, New Jersey. You're on the Michael Medved Show with Megan McArdle. She's the author of The Upside of Down. Thanks, Mike. Uh, good way to get snowed in listening to the show. I'd like to ask her, though, <laughs> is there an upside to this Obama administration? Uh, it's an immature and reckless regime. And I just want to see if you can figure out some way that we can find a positive in this downside turn in, uh, 
in our nation's history. I certainly have been against a lot of the, the policies that Obama has pursued. Um, I was a vocal critic of Obamacare, for example. Um, but yeah, I think that there is an upside. And let me put it this way, is that you know, in the book I talk about the fact that often the best way to find out what doesn't work, what works is to find out what doesn't work. And that's often the fastest way to find out, no, that really doesn't work, we shouldn't do that. Um, and I think with Obamacare, you have a good example um, that we've actually found out a lot of things that don't work in the insurance market and in healthcare reform. The question now, and this is what I focus a lot of the book on, is can we cut our losses, recognize what we did that doesn't work, and move on from it? Um, I don't think that that's clear yet, but I actually think that signs are more encouraging than I would have expected a year ago that people are really grappling, grappling with the possibility that Obamacare really isn't working at all and that something different needs to be, needs to be done and that a lot of it may, may have to be undone. And, and one of the things, and I think it's, it's true, is that uh, Bill Kristol has said recently that he thinks that uh, 2014 is going to be the key year on Obamacare. Is It's the first year it's supposed to be fully implemented or nearly fully implemented, and it's gone very badly. That if President Obama does well in these congressional elections, then we're stuck with this thing. But if if uh, there is the tidal wave kind of election that a lot of Republicans are hoping for, then the thing will begin to be dismantled and we will never go back there again. I mean, because people have learned their lesson. Now, people are angry about this, don't you think, Megan? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, when it was passed, I remember saying at the time, I didn't think it was going to pass, uh, you know, after Scott Brown won and uh, took the Senate seat in Massachusetts. I thought that Democrats were going to say, okay, well, we tried, we failed, it's time to go back to the drawing board. And they didn't, and they pushed forward with a slightly unusual procedural trick to get the, the law passed, even though it was really unpopular. And at the time I said, this seems crazy to me. How can you jam through this law that doesn't even have you know, plurality support, much less majority support? And everyone assured me, no, no, it's going to get way more popular. That's not even remotely true. It's now as unpopular. It is more unpopular than it was when it was passed. It is basically as unpopular as it has ever been um, with the okay, exception speak, of October. Speak, and so, yeah, people are angry and they're reacting. And speaking of unpopular, uh, the uh, administration's bid for popularity is very much right now tied to the unemployment extension, the extension of unemployment benefits. Megan McArdle has a little section in her book called The Unemployment Trap that dares to be very politically incorrect. We will get to that. We will also get to the problem with conspiracy theories, if you want to succeed, and uh, the true explanations for why we had that awful financial crash and that recession that we're still suffering from. It's not what you think. That's, to me, one of the most useful chapters in the whole book. The book is called The Upside of Down. Uh, Megan McArdle, from a libertarian perspective, is uh, one of the most persuasive and informative writers on economics and business and related political and personal issues as well. Uh, her book is pub, uh, posted up at our website, The Upside of Down. We'll take more of your calls and uh, go to why is it that people can't get over Building 7 at the World Trade Center? Coming up. 1-800-955-1776. The Michael Medved. The America's Strong. It's uh, posted up at our website also at michaelmedved.com or just beamericastrong.com. This is a great affinity group. The 10 and 10 challenge means that they will save you at least 10 times as much as the cost of membership in terms of deals on hotels and restaurants and groceries and drugstore items, everything. They'll either save you 10 times as much as you invest or you get your money back. Check it out at uh, BeAmericaStrong.com. We're speaking with the uh, very strong and insightful um, Megan McArdle. Uh, the, her book is called The Upside of Down. And if there's one problem with the book, it's that there are all kinds of fascinating nuggets illustrating her larger theme of the importance of failure. Let's just for a moment 
uh, go to the the time that you spend on conspiracy theories. And I I've, I really related to that very much, Megan, because we have a conspiracy day every month on the Michael Medved show and it's full moon up there. And a lot of the conspiracies that you were talking about, people really do believe. You do as well as anybody I've seen write out why it is so preposterous to think that this massively incompetent government that can't even do a health care rollout could handle this massive conspiracy for September 11th. Explain for just a moment. Well, I mean, this is exactly the point, right? If, if the government were that competent, Obamacare would be working great. Um, and moreover, when has anyone ever been able to keep a secret that big, right? Look at Edward Snowden being able to get inside the NSA and just sort of hack everyone's passwords within three months. Um, but more broadly, when you look at the case of Building 7 at the World Trade Center, which is where a lot of these conspiracies ended up settling down, um, people said, well, it couldn't have been that – fires brought the building down. The conventional explanation has been there were burning fires between aviation fuel and all of the stuff that caught fire in these buildings that weakened the steel. And eventually this building, along with buildings five and six, four and five and six collapsed. Um, but the conspiracy theory says, no, that's not possible. It must have been a controlled demolition. Now, as it happens, my father, I worked at the World Trade Center site um, for a year. And before that, I actually worked um, I worked at Ground Zero for a year after the the, uh, the planes hit. But even before that, I actually spent a lot of time working on IT consulting jobs in Building 7 and in the rest of the World Trade Center site, which is how I knew it's really ludicrous to think that anyone could have gotten into those walls and placed explosives in the volume that you would need. You know, we, we look in the movies, and it's these tiny little bits of explosives, but when actual demolition experts build, bring a building down, they strip everything down to the concrete. They put massive charges on all the columns. It's quite complex <laughs> how they uh, control the order in which it's coming off. And people would have noticed if anyone had been doing anything like this and there was debt cords strung all over the offices. And when you say this to conspiracy theorists, they start saying, well, but couldn't the CIA have had some special explosive that's, that's smaller and doesn't need all that? But at this point, you're, you're basically – just sort of theorizing a ray gun. If we're going to say that they had special explosives, why not just say that they had special mind control rays that caused the people in the buildings to attack the columns and weaken them before they evacuated? No one saw you, anything you like didn't? that, and it's really unlikely. You're just putting that out there to try to cover the real truth. <laughs> uh, we, we are, we, let, let's go to um, Richard in Seattle. Richard, you're on the Michael Medved Show. Hey guys, hey Megan, I'm a huge fan. So here's my question. You're president, you've got a congresswoman to go along with you. First time it is, what would you do? I'm sorry, but Richard, uh, phrase that again, okay? Uh, Megan, if you became president and you could do whatever you wanted to do, what would you do? Okay, good question. Megan? I think that there's a, a fallacy, which is the, the idea that a lot of people have this dictator fantasy. I've never had this fantasy because I'm well aware that I'm fallible like everyone else and I make mistakes and I don't want unlimited power. Um, but if I had the, the power of persuading people to try what I would like to try, the first thing that I would make sure is that if it didn't work, it was easy to roll back. Um, I, would, I would not make sort of grand immediate plans. What I would try to do is start ratcheting things down. I would change the tax code so that it doesn't penalize success so much so that it it makes it easier on people who've tried something and failed and i would and you also you also have very very key words on extending uh, unemployment benefits we will get to that and more with megan mccardle 1-800-955-1776 the michael medved show 44 minutes after the hour on the Michael Medved Show, where it's easy to save 15% or even more on car insurance with GEICO. You just go to geico.com or call 1-800-947-AUTO. The only hard part is figuring out which way is even easier. And it's not easy to figure out why the difference in attitudes toward failure and cooperation come from the difference between agricultural societies and hunter-gatherer societies. Not so easy to figure it out. But Megan McArdle can help you with that in her book, The Upside of Down. That was, to me, one of the many 
uh, fascinating perspectives that uh, you can get from this book, which is posted at our website. And uh, uh, Megan also talks about what she calls the unemployment trap. And she makes a point here that it seems to me it's going to be very hard for well, people like the President of the United States to answer, which is that um, with a government paying 70 percent, even 90 percent of your former wages, it's easier when you're unemployed to wait for a never-never job, especially if you don't have to go to work while you wait. You could decide that you'd only take a job as a steel worker doing exactly what you'd done before, even if the local steel industry has moved to another country. In other words, you seem to be acknowledging that some of the concerns that uh, conservatives have expressed on Capitol Hill about endlessly extending unemployment benefits are entirely justified. Am I right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we have seen this in Europe time and time again, where, you know, it isn't that failure shouldn't hurt. Failure should hurt because failure is how that that's how you know not to do something again. But the pain should be very specific kind of pain. Um, what Europe tried to do was make it not hurt at all. And the result was that you got a large number of people who stayed out of work for decades, looking, you know, ostensibly looking for another job, but not really ever finding it because they were only going to do what they'd been doing before. And what they'd been doing before wasn't a job anymore. And so you enabled people to make what was, as I talk about in the book, being unemployed feels really terrible and looking for a job feels really terrible often. And so people avoid it. So it's a kind of a rational short-term decision, but it's a terrible long-term decision. And when you're thinking about all sorts of welfare policy, including unemployment benefits, you want to help people make you want to help the rational short-term decision also be the, the long-term decision that's going to make you the best off. And these very high rates of replacement and these sort of unending benefits um, worked against that goal and, and created a real culture of unemployment in Europe. Let's go to uh, Alan in Philadelphia. Alan, you're on the Michael Medved Show with Megan McArdle. Hi, Michael. Thank you for taking my call. Um, you bet. I, I guess I have, a, I have a comment and I have a question. Um, the first is that it seems as though the lessons learned or the upside from all this with the Obama administration and this, and this regime should be more the lessons learned for the American people, which should be to not put our hopes into something that's not a plan, something that's nebulous. I mean, something that was pretty much run on as hope and change. Okay, what are the specifics of hope and change? Don't really know, but whatever it is, there's hope and change that's going to happen. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that concept of failure being extremely important, what it is, there's a certain irrational process that goes on with people that one might call denial that some people don't consider anything to be failure. They consider it to be resistance or people against them or anything else like that, and they don't accept it as failure and learn from it and make changes. And I'm wondering what's going to take for the American people to kind of, as a, as a whole, get to that point where they say, okay, let's look at this, accept it as a failure, learn from it, and move on, rather than just keep being in denial about what they think is working. A great question. Megan? Well, you know, I, I'm sorry to keep dragging you back to Obamacare, but I've been thinking a lot about this for the last few months for obvious reasons, is that I think that you do see that lesson of the, the inability to recognize when things were going wrong, the insistence that we're just going to keep doing exactly what we've been doing, um, that, you know, it's, it's just a little longer um, until it, it all works out. You see this behavior in compulsive gamblers a lot. Um, and so, you see it in GM. You, you tell yes. the story of GM in your book and what went wrong there. It is very hard for organizations. They're optimized for doing one thing. And you can say that the Obama administration was optimized for grand technocratic planning. That was who his vision was of a big technocratic scientific politics, almost a throwback to the, the 1910s and 1920s and 30s, um, and that when that didn't work, they weren't able to adjust. They didn't have outside voices that were tell they didn't hear outside voices that were telling them that it wasn't working. Um, but I do think that people, that kind of technocratic planning, frankly, hasn't gone well so far, and that the American people were, frankly, always a little bit skeptical, but certainly now are more skeptical and very much less likely to sign on to those kinds of plans at any time in the near future. Let's go to David in Ogden, Utah. David, you're on the Medved Show with Megan McArdle. 
Uh, how you doing? Uh, I agree with her, uh, with Megan about a lot of stuff, but uh, technocratic planning as far as this uh, whole Obamacare debacle went, I like to label it technocratic uh, delusion. Because, I mean, the thing was mailed, there was, uh, uh, it was destined to fail from the start. It's not going to work. Um, one thing we got. Well, it's to the do idea of a command and control economy, which is something she writes about. Go ahead. Um, the, the one thing that's been manifest in my life that has caused me a lot of problems is the fact that I uh, leap before I look, you know, basically. And I think that's what has a lot to do with a lot of failures is people just don't sit down and think things out. You know, if you got to sit down with a piece of paper, put two columns, say pro, con, what's going to happen? But, uh, Megan? Basic- well, actually, you know, the leap before you look strategy can work. Uh, it's what a lot of Silicon Valley runs on. You know, I, I actually opened the book with um, the head of user experience design for formerly Palm and now a bunch of other tech companies. And they say, you know, if you want to succeed, you fail fast. But there's an important parameter to that, which is, Try things out, but first of all, make sure that you're not taking a catastrophic risk. Um, It's it's not necessarily that you need to spend weeks planning if you're not that kind of person, and frankly, I'm not either, so I I tend to. But but I think what you're what you're saying what you're saying is trial and error, okay. Trial and suicide, not so much. The book is called The Upside of Down. We'll be right back. Don't forget to take the America Strong Ten and Ten Challenge. Give them ten minutes and. 55 minutes after the hour on the Michael Medved Show, among many, many controversial points made by Megan McArdle in her new book, The Upside of Down. It's posted at our website at michaelmedved.com. She suggests that video games can actually be therapeutic and help people in downtimes, in addition to teaching them all kinds of skills. Uh, Dedicated gamers will be appreciative of that. You also um, talk a a great deal about why people are just wrong about what caused the financial collapse back in 2007, 2008. And you bring up a great point. It's one of those things I slap my forehead and think, why did I think of that? For those people who believe that it's a simple matter, the government deregulated, business ran wild, business did what it always does when it's deregulated, it starts destroying things. One of the worst countries to, in terms of suffering from the economic collapse was Spain. And they didn't have a deregulation problem there. Highly regulated. Banks highly regulated. The housing market highly regulated. They didn't have Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. They didn't have any of that. And yet they had a worse housing bubble than we did. Why was that? Well, because there was a lot of what I think of as stupid money sloshing around the, the international world. You know, when we're investing abroad, we're never quite as intelligent about it as when we're investing locally and we understand better. And in the the 1990s and the 2000s, there were a lot of people who were desperate for returns. And they started sort of shipping this money everywhere looking for those returns. A lot of it ended up in the mortgage market in developed countries all over the world. And so you see these, these patterns, not just in America, but in Spain and Portugal and Italy, lots of places having property bubbles, England, Australia. Um, and so we tend to have these explanations for the financial crisis that reflect concerns we already had. And so when it happened, you heard uh, liberals say, oh, well, this must have been deregulation. Um, on the other side, you know, people saying Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, but in fact, it was so broad, um, affected so many people, that none of these explanations is really satisfying. What actually is perhaps the sad truth is that very occasionally, very rarely, what twice in, in 70 years, markets get into a, a kind of a bad feedback loop where they're just going to go a little too haywire and uh, we're all going to have to sort of work our way out of the wreckage after they collapse. Do you think we're on the verge of another bubble? I think that you see some evidence, uh, certainly in some housing markets. I'm in Washington, D.C., where we're back at above the, uh, the housing bubble levels, and it's true in New York and San Francisco and several other places. Um, but I do think that people have somewhat learned their lessons. 
And, you know, this is what people said about the Great Depression, was that you didn't actually need all the regulation that FDR put in as much as you needed a lot of bankers who had lived through the Great Depression and who, when they saw it happening again, and you can actually see this in experimental economics labs, that when they, people who have been through a bubble in these artificial asset markets, the second or third time... Then, they then saying, can hey, actually learn from their experience and learning from failure the theme of the upside of down. The new book, it is posted at our website. Thank you, Megan McArdle, for your contributions to This Greatest Nation on God's Green Earth.